Shimki Sup was cautious when opening the hotel room door, only leaving a small gap to prevent the worker from seeing the chaos that was behind it. Any closer and the man would have picked up on the bloody stench on Kisup's body, likely reporting him to the police. Time was running out, and Kisup needed to act fast to convince the worker to leave. Do you need me to fix your toilet? asked the worker. No. I can manage it myself. I'd be too embarrassed if you saw the mess. Kisup hid his bloody hand behind his back as he lied. The worker handed him the plunger and left. Kisup quickly shut the door, locked it, and sighed a breath of relief, returning to the horrors he'd created. Welcome to Cran True Crime, with me, your host, Mimi Mizuko. Thank you to Vix Mack, Lala, Ben Jones, Ashley Rigby, William White, Jiwon Edwards, Nico, Elijah Hancock, Anominom, Dr. Bob, Maya 96, Lumos, Emma Brown, David Tafoya, and Adriana for your support on Patreon. Thank you for voting on today's episode topic. Patrons vote on future episode topics and hear the episodes first with ad-free early access. Thank you for making this show possible. Warning. Today's episode contains sexual assault, necrophilia, and mentions of body dismemberment. Listener discretion is advised. What was that? On Sunday, July 7, 2013, 19-year-old Shim ki Sup was spending time with a childhood friend, pseudonym Junho. They'd known each other since middle school, and despite their lives going in very different directions, they remained friends. ki Sup dropped out of school when they were just in high school together, but Junho stayed in school and was a college student now. Junho went to Sungnam to meet ki Sup at the coffee shop he had been working at part-time. They were trying to find something to do that night, but since neither of them liked to drink alcohol, they were having difficulty finding something to do. Drinking culture is quite prevalent in Korea, so most of the places open late at night are just bars and clubs. There isn't much else to do late at night, but there are some alternatives, like computer cafes, singing rooms, DVD rooms, and sometimes board game cafes are open late. They ultimately chose to go to a DVD room where you can go and rent a small room that has a television, sofa, and various games and electronics. The entertainment in these rooms varies by location, but typically you can watch movies, play video games, or order snacks and drinks. Gisup and Jinho spent some time watching movies and catching up with each other. Afterwards, they went to a nearby billiards bar and stayed up all night playing well until the early hours of the next day, Monday, July 8th. I should mention that the drinking age in South Korea is 19, so they are old enough to drink, they just don't like to drink alcohol. After having stayed up all night with his friend, they agreed they were both exhausted and decided just to get a hotel nearby instead of traveling back home. Hotels can be incredibly cheap, and some even offer overnight only or hourly rates that are very inexpensive. Typically, these are referred to as love motels. From the CCTV of the hotel's lobby, we know they checked in at 5.28 a.m. and Kisup was carrying his electric guitar case with him. When they woke up, they decided to keep the hotel room for the remainder of the day because they woke up after 2 p.m. and would have already been charged for not checking out. At 2.40 p.m., Kisup sent a text to a 17-year-old girl he had recently met named pseudonym Haum. He texted her, Come hang out with us. We're hanging out at a hotel. Let's hang out. At about 3.30 p.m., Halm arrived at the hotel and the three friends decided to watch TV and chat. Shortly later, Junho decided to leave because he needed to visit a doctor to get treatment for some conjunctivitis he had in one of his eyes. Gisub decided he would go with Junho to the doctor, but Halm could stay at the hotel until they got back. The appointment wouldn't take very long, he said, and it didn't. They would return 30 minutes later from the clinic at 4.30 p.m. While Jin Ho had been seen by the doctor, however, Kisup decided he would go to a nearby convenience store and purchase something for later. He purchased two large box cutters and two small stationary box cutters. Without Jin Ho knowing, Kisup hid these under his clothes and brought them back to the hotel room. The friends continued to waste time together hanging out until a few hours later at 7.18 p.m. Junho says that he can't stay out any later because he needs to study for class the next day. He says goodbye to them and leaves Kisup and Halm at the hotel. 
Kisup and Hallam continued to do not much of anything, watching TV, talking about their favorite music, until a short while after Jinho left. Kisup turned to Hallam, and his laughing, smiling face suddenly went dark. The friendly person she was just talking to disappeared, and Kisup began to make unwanted and predatory advances on Hallam. She tried to politely decline his advances until they became aggressive and mean. She tried to excuse herself and go home until Kisa pulled the box cutter from his pocket and held the blade to Helm's throat. He shouted at her to do what he said, and he got on top of her. Kisa began to force himself onto Helm, but was interrupted by a knock on the door. At first, he ignored the knock, but the person knocked again, this time calling out, Hey, it's me, Jinho. I forgot my phone. Kisop whispered threats to Helm that if she screamed, he would kill her. When he opened the door, Jinho tried to come in, but Kisop made an excuse suggesting that he shouldn't come in because they were being indecent. It was implied that Kisop and Helm were in the middle of being intimate. Jinho took the hint and patiently waited at the door for Kisop to grab his phone and return. Kisop grabbed the phone and tossed it to Jinho and said goodbye before slamming the door shut in its face. Gisup returned to Halm and saw that she had grabbed her phone from the floor. At 7.46 p.m., Halm tried to send a text for help quickly while Kisup was still at the door, but her phone wasn't fast enough and Kisup knocked the phone out of her hands and began to hit her. He didn't waste any time before returning to forcing himself on her, but Halm strongly resisted his attempts. Kisup wasn't a strong person and rarely exercised, so he was struggling to overpower her, which began to anger him more. As she fought him, His hands moved to her throat and he began to choke her. She kicked, scratched, and punched at Kisup, who squeezed tightly until she lost consciousness. But Kisup wouldn't let go of her. He continued to strangle her until he killed her. He took her corpse onto the bed and sexually assaulted her corpse for over an hour. At 9 p.m., he decided to drag her body to the bathroom where he filled the bathtub with water. He placed her corpse in the water and returned to the bedroom to retrieve his box cutters. He started to coldly, calmly, and without hesitation, cut all of the flesh from her body for the next four hours. He would remove a small piece, flush it down the toilet, and then return and do it again. At one point, the toilet became clogged, so he called to the front desk and asked them to bring up a toilet plunger. They asked, did you put toilet paper in the toilet? And he lied, yes, I did, I'm sorry. In Korea, like many other countries, you cannot flush toilet paper in older buildings. However, it's more common now to be able to flush toilet paper in public and private restrooms. When the manager brought up the plunger, he tried to enter the room, but Kisup stopped him. He convinced the manager that he would be too embarrassed if the man saw the mess and he could plunge the toilet all by himself. The manager agreed and gave him the plunger and Kisup closed the door quickly. The longer the interaction went on, the easier it would be for the person to smell the blood from the other room. He was ventilating the bathroom and airing out the room to minimize the smell as best he could. It's clear that he had thoroughly thought about what he would do before beginning. Although Kisup denies having planned the murder, it's clear that the idea of murdering someone at some point had crossed his mind enough that he was prepared to murder whenever the opportunity arose. He had thought about submerging her body in water to minimize the mess and to easily drain blood without splatter. He'd thought about how to dispose of her body by flushing it in pieces down the toilet. He'd thought about what tools to use and was able to complete these horrendous and heinous acts without hesitation. I think any person with functioning empathy and sanity would vomit at the mere thought of this. He had an extremely calm demeanor the entire time, as if cleaning up a mess after a party. He would continue his routine until the only part remaining of Helm were her bones, weighing less than 15 kilograms or 33 pounds. He started to try to break the larger bones or cut them using his box cutter, which was quite difficult. His knife broke, so he left the hotel room and visited another convenience store nearby and purchased more box cutters. He returned a few minutes later to continue. I'm not sure how his clothes were not completely soiled by blood, but no eyewitnesses saw blood on him and the front desk worker at the hotel didn't notice anything strange, so it's possible that he removed his clothes while he was performing these horrendous acts. All while this is happening, even from the beginning, Shim Kisop is taking breaks to send texts to Junho. 
In fact, he had texted Junho immediately following putting her body in the bathtub. At 9 p.m., he had texted Junho, Jokop Jungya, Pipoko Uso, I'm working on it, I'm drawing blood. The it in the sentence isn't defined, so Junho didn't have any context for what it was that he was working on. At around midnight, after having already started mutilating her body, Kisab stopped to read Junho's response. Junho had responded, What do you mean? And Kisab again said, I'm drawing blood right now. But this time, he took a picture of what he had done to Haum and sent it to Junho. Junho would say that the picture was so grotesque, he couldn't even believe that it was real. They both had seen some pretty gruesome movies before, so he thought this was just another sick prank by Kisab. He had a pretty dark humor. These photos are not available on the internet, thankfully, but a description of the photographs were given by Junho in his interview. He said that the one image he cannot forget showed Ham's body in the bathtub with her stomach opened as Kisup removed her organs first. He thought that Kisup had found this disgusting photograph on the internet and sent it to him to make fun of him for interrupting Kisup and Halm earlier, but it made him feel sick, so Junho responded, don't joke like that. Kisup wasn't in any of the photographs at this point and neither was Ham's face, so he hoped that he was correct in believing that nobody he knew, especially his friend, could have done something like this. But Shim Kisup started taking more and more photos of Ham's body and sending it to Junho. He kept sending messages like, I will go to hell and be punished, or I want to rest a little bit now. Junho was convinced now that this was a sick prank because of just how many photos there were that he thought this was some kind of special effects test photos from a movie that some effects artists had taken and posted online. So he ignored Kisop's texts and went to sleep. Shim Kisop went back to his task and continued until around 1.15 a.m., about six hours after he had attacked Haum. He started to clean up the bathroom and himself. After he was done, at around 1.30 a.m., he left the hotel again to go to a nearby grocery store and purchased large black plastic bags and put what couldn't be flushed inside the opaque black bags. At 2.07 a.m., he left the hotel for the final time with the black plastic bag in hand. Typically, you can get black plastic bags when you visit any store. This may seem really insignificant that he's using a black bag, but these black bags are typically only given because they are made from recycled materials and are cheaper to produce. But they cannot be used for household trash and are not picked up by trash collectors. Because if you aren't from Korea, the trash system may be quite unique to you. You must purchase trash bags with your specific district's information on them. You can't use other districts' trash bags and you must dispose of your trash in those bags. These bags are placed outside of the apartment building, either in a trash area for large apartments, or just placed on the ground outside your apartment building near a streetlight or a curb. For example, the apartments I've lived in, the trash just went outside next to the parking area in a large pile. It sounds quite gross, and it can be. Having lived here for six years, it can be smelly, but it's collected often and recyclables are sorted neatly, so it's an efficient system nonetheless. But if you throw your trash away in these black bags that are not the proper bags, they almost always have CCTV watching the area and you will be fine. They may even go through your trash to find receipts or information about who put that trash bag there. I specify this because I know the vast majority of my listeners are outside of Korea where buying trash bags is done at a grocery store and you can like choose your brand and style. I've never needed to buy any other kind of trash bag here except for the city's bags. So because Shimki Sup is using this black bag, it looks odd, but it also doesn't look incredibly out of place like it may elsewhere because this type of bag can be used for carrying laundry, grocery store items, or anything you'd carry around. But you wouldn't immediately assume that it was trash he was carrying. From the CCTV footage, he actually did get some weird looks when he left the hotel because the bag was quite large and he was hugging it like a pillow. He carried the bag out of the hotel at 2.07 a.m. on the morning of the 9th and got in a taxi he hailed from the street. He asked the taxi driver to take him to Edong neighborhood where he lived with his grandmother, parents, and older brother. He lived in a detached mobile home next to their house. When the taxi driver dropped him off at his home, he retrieved a plastic container tub and placed the bags with Helm's bone inside and sealed it. 
The container was then hidden inside of his wardrobe. At this point, he was home and reflecting on everything he had done, but not with grief or remorse. He decides to post on social media, Cacao Story to be exact. Cacao Story is an application and website where people can post short life updates or whatever they want to a public platform. Cacao Story is not used really anymore as it once was. Most teens and young adults in Korea have abandoned the platform for more trendy and mainstream social media like Instagram. Cacao Story is now mostly known for being used by older people. This can be considered like Korea's Facebook. But Kisa posted on his Kakao story, which he was very frequently active on. These posts often included figurative language and poems. I'm going to read some of his posts that he made after he got home. Not all of his posts were preserved, but the ones that screenshots remain of, I've translated with the assistance of a professional translator. On July 9th, 2013, at 3.29 a.m., about seven hours since murdering home, he wrote, For me. The emotions I can feel towards humans have dried up. I don't feel any emotions of guilt, nor any emotions of sadness. I didn't feel anger. I couldn't even feel it. And only a very brief smile greeted me. Today, I will sleep covered in this bloody smell. He then posted a poem. Turn to ashes and fly away. That you didn't have any feelings, I don't know if you'll understand. There were no bad feelings, no good feelings. Hate. He followed up with a more aggressive message. I wanted to be a son of a bitch today. They say only a son of a bitch can do this. Yeah, I was a son of a bitch today. I didn't change my expression at all. Let's go to hell and get our punishment. Finally, he wrote speaking directly to Helm. I praise your courage to look at me straight in the eye until the last moment. Thank you. Your eyes made it clear that you were not afraid. Shim Kisup also began sending images and texts to his ex-girlfriend similar to those that he had sent to Junho. When she asked if this was real, he began replying, Does this look like a joke to you? Do you want to work with me? Shim Kisup didn't appear to have any remorse and was romanticizing his actions through poems and figurative language. His attitude about his brutal actions showed signs of delusion. Junho felt worried about his friend and about the images he had seen. When he woke up, he started doubting if all of it really was a prank. He sent a message to Kisup saying, Manaja, let's meet. Kisup agreed to meet up with Junho. When he left his home at 6 p.m., he sent a text to Junho that said, I miss the smell of cherry blossoms whenever I smell it. It's nice and comfortable to smell it here on the bus. He referred to the smell of blood on his body. After finally meeting up with Junho, he didn't waste any time hiding his crimes. He clearly wanted Jinho to know what he had done. He wanted everyone to know. Either he didn't care about being caught, or he was so deep in his delusions that it wasn't even on his radar. He was pleased with what he had done. He had no concerns. However, Jinho helped him return to reality, and after hearing Kisup's fully detailed confession, he knew he had to convince Kisup to turn himself in. After rationalizing or begging Kisup to realize what he had done, Kisup agreed that he should turn himself in. However, he decided at 6.28 to first make one more post to his cacao story stating, I feel at ease today. I will be hated, but I should go peacefully. Kisup returned to his home and it's unknown what he did for the next few hours. It's likely that he took some time to reflect, but he didn't show signs of remorse when he finally left his home and went to the Yongin police station at 12.30 a.m. that night. He was taken in peacefully as he said, but his attitude was closer to acceptance than regret. It was confounding how a 19-year-old young man could have committed such heinous acts just hours prior and gone through the horrendous process of dismembering a body without hesitation. His actions were unprecedented by mental illness or criminal records, according to the police. It's likely he suffered without diagnosis or by preventing diagnosis. But the police continued to say that he did not have any prior mental illness, but immediately it was reported that he had attempted suicide the previous October and received crisis treatment for two weeks in the hospital. He'd attempted suicide by jumping into the sea from Wolmi Island in Incheon, but was rescued and taken to the hospital. He was released from protective care in the hospital without any mental illness diagnosis. Instead, his chart stated that he attempted suicide due to stress of an unknown origin. He showed no signs of mental illness according to these doctors. 
It's an interesting detail when you think about what he ultimately did. How is it possible he didn't show any signs of aggression or violence to others, but then suddenly decided to commit one of the worst crimes? On the day of his arrest, July 10th, 2013, at 3 p.m., he was interviewed by reporters when being moved to the police station. He was asked the burning question, Why did you do this? Shim ki thought for a moment and calmly answered, I've always liked cruel movies, and I've also searched for anatomy on the internet. His answer sparked the follow-up, Did you think about doing something like in those movies? His answer was simply, at least once. Another reporter asked, what was your state of mind when you committed the crime? Gisup said, I only thought that I had to live. I dismembered the body to escape the scene. Later when I got home, I felt guilty, so I turned myself in. Despite us knowing countless details about this case, questions still remain. Who was Shim Gisup? What went wrong? And was this preventable? Jim Kisup was born in 1994 in a middle-class family. Kisup's father was an office worker at a large company, and his mother was an elementary school teacher. He has an older brother, and together they lived relatively well off. He moved to Iran in 2003 when his father got a good job offer. He entered an international school with other Korean students. He stayed in Iran from age 9 to 14. In 2008, in his second year of middle school, at the age of 14, he returned to Korea and continued his studies but he was struggling to keep up with his peers. The Korean education system can be unforgiving, especially if you've been away from it for a long time. When Shim Ki-sup was in high school, he then decided that music was his passion and that staying in school wasn't going to help him anymore. So he dropped out of school in 2011 in his second year of high school. He only had one more year of high school, but the final year really prepares you for university and he knew he wasn't going to pursue university. He decided to return the next year in 2012 to try to graduate high school. After a few months, he decided to drop out of school again, though. Since dropping out of school, he moved into a mobile home next to his family's house and covered his own living expenses by working at a coffee shop part-time. According to his friends, he spent most of his time practicing the electric guitar, which he posted often online about. He often posted about his electric guitar collection and pictures of his cat that he named Chamchi, which means tuna. To everyone around him, he was the kind of guy who brought a guitar to parties. He often played ACDC songs, and his dream was to study music in France. Absolutely no one around him suspected the darkness inside of him. It makes you wonder if anyone truly was close to him, or if he was really skilled at keeping acquaintances instead of friends. Haum had a similar experience to Shim Kisup growing up. In fact, it makes sense that they would have become friends in an alternate reality. However, she was about three years younger than Shim Kisup. Haum grew up in Singapore and moved to Korea in 2010 when she was in the third year of middle school. She had a difficult time in school and decided to drop out. She lived in a small office tell in Yongin by herself and supported herself by working part-time. Her parents had returned to Singapore a few years later, so she was all by herself, but she kept in touch with her family often. Halm and Kisup faced comparable challenges in school, as neither of them excelled in that particular environment. Halm had only met Kisup a few times, despite the police stating that they were close friends or dating. They'd only ever met twice before and had exchanged some text messages. They were only just recently becoming friends. When Kisup was interviewed, he revealed that his favorite film was Hostel, written and directed by Eli Roth. This film is part of an extreme cinema subgenre known for its extreme acts of mutilation and torture. You may have heard of this genre referred to as torture porn. Other examples of films in this subgenre are Old Boy, directed by Park John uk Passion of the Christ, directed by Mel Gibson, and a favorite of mine, Martyrs, directed by Pascal Lozier. Eli Roth and these directors famously use violence in their films, and interviewers believe that Shim Kisup's consumption of violent media could have been the cause of his desire to murder. But does research really support that? I don't often discuss anything personal in my podcast because I don't find personal commentary to be respectful in the presentation of true crime. But I'd like to share that I'm a very enthusiastic horror fan, which I find a lot of true crime fans also are. I also have a background in criminology. So when we see Korean media call this case the hostel killer, not for the involvement of the hotel, but for his enjoyment of the film Hostel, is there a negative influence on consumers of horror or violent media that could drive them to kill? 
According to the American Psychological Association, there is a small reliable association between violent video games and aggressive outcomes. Aggressive outcomes means yelling, cursing, pushing, etc. Minor aggressive acts. The Australian government found a very consistent and undeniable correlation between violent media and aggressive affects. Ultimately, the most significant effect size for violent video game exposure and aggressive behavior was quite small when the researchers looked at prior aggression to violent video game participation. Quantitative reviews have found direct associations between violent video game use and aggressive outcomes. And the same is true for television and movies. However, this study focused on children's consumption because children are more easily influenced by the media they see. We must look at these studies with nuance. Aggression is not the same as violence. Aggression is self-reported feelings of anger, yelling, unhelpful behavior, and physiological arousal. These studies found that because of the high rates of prior aggression in those who were aggressive after seeing violent media, it's most likely that the relationship is bidirectional meaning people who are aggressive may be attracted to aggressive things. However, some people without prior aggression would have an increase in their aggressive behaviors. Both can be true. But the correlation between violent media and violence has never been established. According to the American Psychological Association, there's insufficient evidence to support a link between violent video games and violent behavior. It's important to note that nonviolent people can also be attracted to violent media, just as violent people may be. Attraction to violent media is not reflective of your violence tendencies. People who become obsessed with violent media may be encouraged by what they see or influenced towards more violent behavior, but it's also because they're seeking out validation and exposing themselves to violent media in large doses. Life imitates art and art imitates life. I'd like to credit the two experts who created a collection of free resources on this topic. However, they were anonymous. All of these studies are included in my sources for free. So, Shimki Sup's prior aggression hadn't been established, but his consumption of horror films and violent media weren't the sole cause of his actions. However, it's undeniable that violent media was influencing him as a person interested in and attracted to violence. People who knew Shimki Sup described him as a very proud, and confident person who was very sure of himself. Because he was so confident, a lot of people also thought he was entitled or a perfectionist. But that's quite far from the truth. In reality, Kisup was extremely pessimistic, had low self-esteem, and was very critical of himself. He put on a show for those around him to appear more outgoing and perfect. But in reality, he struggled with mental health issues that ultimately changed the trajectory of his life. Yoon Ho, a professor of police administration at Dongguk University, stated the following day that he believes Shim Kisup is not a psychopath because his actions stated otherwise. A psychopath wouldn't be likely to post their actions online. He states his reasoning is that Shimki Sup was a loner who dropped out of school and didn't work. I would like to clarify that the professor made a mistake. Shimki Sup had indeed dropped out of school, but had worked different part-time jobs since dropping out of school a few years prior. He was able to hold down a job. He was even working at his part-time job the day prior to the crime. Professor E continues that Gisa became obsessed with violence and gore through the media he consumed on the internet and through movies and eventually came to identify with these violent actions. Professor E concluded that it's important to distinguish between a sociopath and a psychopath. I agree. The terms are often used interchangeably, which only serves to stigmatize. In summary, a sociopath and a psychopath are not real diagnostic criteria for mental health professionals. You cannot be diagnosed as a sociopath or a psychopath. Sociopathy is a subcategory underneath the antisocial personality disorder diagnosis. The term sociopath is no longer used. Antisocial personality disorder with sociopathic criteria, ASPD, is incredibly rare and affects less than 3% of the population, being more prevalent in men. I present this information from the DSM-5 definitions and with criminology research. People who have antisocial personality disorder have impairment in their ability to empathize, which includes a lack of remorse in proper situations. They may also have difficulty forming intimate relationships, and exploitation is a driving factor in keeping and maintaining friendships. There are many more symptoms of ASPD because there are many forms of ASPD. Antisocial is not the same as asocial. Antisocial does not refer to social relationships. Antisocial refers to behavior that goes against society's rules. 
However, people with ASPD often have different emotional responses than typically expected and have difficulty valuing the feelings of others. Films and TV shows often depict ASPD and psychopaths as one and the same, or as unfeeling monsters. But I think it is with this stigma that makes it difficult for people with ASPD to receive mental health treatment. A person with ASPD has a working, functioning conscience and the ability to know right and wrong. However, they may disregard these feelings. Because of such, those with ASPD are at a higher risk for risky behaviors like drug and alcohol abuse or suicide. Research shows that ASPD is treatable. However, people with ASPD are often excluded from mental health care and research studies, meaning that research is only recently being done. ASPD is more prevalent than schizophrenia, which only affects about 1% of the population. It's a disservice to society that research has not been done into improving the quality of life of those with ASPD, and since ASPD is considered a robust predictor of violent recidivism, it's for the best of society that we offer treatment. ASPD, like many forms of mental illness, can develop from both genetic factors and a person's physiology. Substance abuse and trauma can also be risk factors. A family history is also a strong predictor for the development of sociopathic tendencies. Before the age of 18, as Gisup was when he first displayed symptoms, ASPD can only be diagnosed as conduct disorder. Children with conduct disorder misbehave, show aggression, lie often, or disregard rules. According to the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, approximately 50% of children diagnosed with conduct disorder will later in life meet the criteria for ASPD. Conduct disorder is also the most common mental illness issue in children, affecting about 5% of kids. You may have heard the phrase, sociopaths are made, psychopaths are born, but this is far from the truth. Both ASPD and psychopathy have genetic components, but not in similar ways. Psychopathy is still used as a clinical term, however, it's not diagnosable. Because psychopathy has overlapping criteria for ASPD, about a third of people diagnosed with ASPD meet the criteria for psychopathy. So ASPD sociopathic subcategory includes indifference to right and wrong and disregarding others' feelings. But psychopathy describes a person who intentionally endangers other with violent behavior, has poor impulse control, and difficulty feeling guilt or remorse. Some murderers, mass murderers, serial killers, and other such violent criminals have been determined to have psychopathic traits. However, not all do. The development of psychopathic traits is heavily influenced by a person's nature and in most cases develops prior to the age of 10. This can include violent acts, poor judgment, lack of guilt, inappropriate sexual behavior, manipulative behavior, among many other symptoms. However, people with psychopathic traits may not have a personality disorder at all, but ASPD is a personality disorder, which is why the two overlap significantly. Professor E believed Kisup to have ASPD without psychopathic traits. Kisup had displayed symptoms of ASPD prior to his crime with his attempted suicide in the previous fall. It's likely he struggled a lot in social situations that greatly affected him emotionally. However, this doesn't explain what led up to him escalating without any prior violent behavior. In another interview, Kisup was asked about what could have inspired him to commit such heinous acts. Kisup explained that he had an interest in watching gory videos on the internet. At first, he hadn't thought ever about recreating any of the violence and gore he'd seen online, but after time, he started to fantasize about it. In fact, he initially said he had no intentions of killing Helm, but he instead wanted to simply make sexual advances on her that day, and when she rejected him, he decided to sexually assault her. He just thought he would need something to threaten her with, so he purchased the box cutter, which is what he said. But when we see that he purchased multiple box cutters, it seems a little less believable that he didn't intentionally plan to kill her. Despite Gisa going to the police station to turn himself in, he wasn't considered to have turned himself in because Halm was already considered a missing person. Halm's parents, who still lived in Singapore, had reported her missing after she didn't answer their calls. They were very close and communicated often because of the distance between them. The police were easily able to determine that Gisup was the last person to see Helm after obtaining her phone records. The police were already trying to track him down when he came to the police station to surrender. Gisup was taken through the crime scene recreation, also known as on-site inspection, at the hotel in Yongin, where he had to recreate the actions that he did. 
At this point, he had confessed, he'd recreated the crime, but he wasn't arrested or held in custody. This was two days after he confessed on July 12th. When he was interviewed on TV, his face was blurred. No identifying information was shared about him or Hum, and they referred to it only as the Youngin Bazaar murder. Netizens still discovered his identity within days of his confession. Not only did they find out his identity and Helms, but people essentially found out everything about him because he was constantly posting online about every piece of his life. He had no privacy now because he put everything out there for the world to see. It became a large discussion online about the dangers of posting online about yourself because of how easily people were able to find his identity, address, and phone number. Immediately following his arrest, Kisup's case was compared to that of another famous murderer, Owan Chun, who was arrested the previous year, 2012, for the kidnapping, murder, and dismemberment of a woman in Suan. I'll be covering that case as the next bonus content on Patreon. There were suspicions that Kisup was inspired by Owan Chun's case and wanted to be considered as notorious and evil as this man was. The Owan Chun case received a lot of media attention and very strong emotional responses from the public. But when they asked Kisup about it, he denied having any knowledge of the Owan Chun case and had only ever heard about it vaguely. While not unbelievable, it's improbable. Because of the connection between these two cases, Sergeant Kim Jingu, a criminal psychological analyst who profiled Owan Chun, was in charge of analyzing Shim Kisup as well. In the process of his interrogation on July 18, 2013, Kisup's profiling was conducted using the PAI personality test. The PAI personality test, or the Personality Assessment Inventory Test, is conducted by a psychologist looking to diagnose a clinical disorder or screen for psychological psychopathology. The test has 344 questions and takes about an hour to administer. Each question or statement is rated on a four-point true or false scale, one being not true at all, two slightly true, three mainly true, and four very true. The test has been thoroughly validated with more than 50 measures of psychopathology and is used worldwide. The test is considered the first step in determining if the person has signs of personality disorder or psychopathology. The test includes 22 non-overlapping scales of four varieties, validity scales, clinical scales, treatment consideration scales, and interpersonal scales. The validity scales measure the person's approach to the test. For example, are they trying to fake being worse than they are? Are they trying to fake being better than they are? Are they answering really inconsistently when asked the same question in different ways? It also tests for if the person is being defensive, faking a mental illness, or under severe stress. The clinical scales determine a person's psychopathology and any traits that they may present, such as alcohol problems, anxiety, somatic concerns, mania, and others. The third scale, the treatment consideration scale, measures the person's risk factors not captured in psychiatric diagnosis. This can include stress, isolation, suicidal thoughts, and aggression. The final scale, interpersonal scale, finds the degrees at which a person displays dominant assertive traits or empathic and kind traits. As a result of this test, Kisup was determined to be self-centered, narcissistic, and have a strong tendency to make decisions based on the situation. He also had strong impulsive and antisocial characteristics. However, he was not diagnosed with anything yet. He would need to undergo further evaluations. The explanation by the doctor was that Shim ki moved to Korea after living in Iran for his elementary school years. Because he didn't make any close friendships as a child, he became psychologically isolated and suffered because of this. He didn't fight with his family, but they weren't close, so he didn't feel like he had anyone close to him to confide in when he was a child. Shim ki had a lot of fantasies about harming others growing up. Specifically, it was fantasies about dissection and human anatomy. Criminal psychologists at the police station believed Shimki Sup when he stated that he was not imitating his favorite movies. He was drawn to them because he didn't have anywhere else to see his fantasies played out. Because of these feelings, he was given the psychopathy test as well, but as we know, he didn't fall under the category of having psychopathic traits. Following his interviews, there were no updates on the case for the public for a long while. The last they'd heard of Gisa was when he came before reporters to apologize for his actions. He didn't have any statements he wanted to make to Helm's family and wouldn't answer any questions about the post online. Instead, he simply muttered, I'm sorry, with his head down. 
Five months passed, and finally, on December 9th, 2013, Kesup was charged with murder and the prosecution sought the death penalty, which of course was not going to happen, but the prosecution wanted to show how severe they wanted the punishment to be. The decision was made because of the severity and cruelty of his crimes. Ham's father spoke in court and said, When it comes to hell, this is hell. My daughter died miserably. Please make a wise judgment and sentence him to death. In Kesup's final statement, he denied some of the charges that were against him. It was a shock to everyone to hear him speak into the microphone and say, I am sincerely sorry to the victim and her family. I am reflecting on my actions. However, I did not buy the knife with the intention to kill her, and I also did not force myself on her when we had sex. No further statements were made. They returned to court on December 27th for the sentencing. The court found him guilty on all charges and sentenced him to life in prison. He was found guilty on charges of murder and desecration of a corpse. The judge's statement was that he believed Shim Kisap had no potential for reform or improvement if he would have been released and therefore life imprisonment was the only option. Kisap's appalling actions, which blatantly disregarded the value of human life, reveal a startling lack of empathy and morality. His decision to share photos of these reprehensible acts with his friend demonstrates not only his twisted mindset, but also his lack of remorse. Understanding the underlying factors that contribute to criminal behavior, particularly those associated with mental illness, can aid in developing effective preventative measures and targeted interventions. By prioritizing mental health, research initiatives, we can support individuals on the verge of losing their humanity, provide effective treatment, and work towards creating a safer environment for our community. Ultimately, investing in research and education around mental health issues is critical to creating a more compassionate and empathetic society. As always, thank you for listening to Korean True Crime. I hope you enjoyed today's episode topic. If you'd like to vote on future episode topics, you can join Korean True Crime on Patreon today. If you'd like to hear more, follow the show wherever you listen and be sure to leave a review. See you next time.